Here's what you did. You're going to have the, as I mentioned, expressives, the amiables, the drivers, and the analyticals. Let's get started with the expressives. The expressives, <laughs> some people call them the star types. Uh, what they are is the type that comes into work and they are always seen and heard wherever they go. They're very visible people. They thrive off of being seen and heard. The last thing you want to do with an expressive personality type is ignore them and make them feel as though they are unnoticed. They will find a new job where they are noticed. Now, that doesn't mean they're egomaniacs. That just means they do not want to be invisible. And by the way, when I talk about these four types, I'm going to make caricatures of these types. Uh, so we can all be an extreme type or a moderate type. But if I'm talking about these personality types, I'm going to use extreme language and create caricatures of these people so that you can spot them more easily. For example, the expressive types, I like to think of each one of these types as driving a certain type of car or certain types of cars go along with each of these types. And the expressives tend to come into work driving Mustang convertibles. You know, they are seen and heard wherever they go. They're a, it's a visible flashy car. They like things also such as Cadillac Escalades, a big, shiny, pretty car. They like sports cars. They like uh, motorcycles. They like cool cars. And they like cars that, for example, make noise. Like there's that new Fiat car that has a special noise that it makes because of the muffler. Remember like uh, when, uh, I think it's the Volkswagen Bugs, they used to have a special sound that they made, that special uh, muffler, how they would... Well, the new Fiat also has a special sound to it. And by the look of that car and the sound of that car, it is made for expressive personality types. Expressive also, person, uh, expressives also come in wearing sparkly clothes. You know, the, during the Christmas season, for example, or the holiday season, I should say, they will come in wearing like antlers with little bells on them. They'll be wearing jingle bell earrings. They'll be wearing sweaters, if at all possible, that actually light up. You know, like they might have a little battery pack in it and it's the Christmas tree sweater that actually sparkles and if it can make noise, that's their favorite Christmas sweater. Uh, they will wear a lot of colors in their clothing. They'll wear a lot of patterns in their clothing. They will experiment with their hairstyle. They tend to talk a lot. They are very big picture thinkers. Uh, and so they tend to, in their office space, be a little more disorganized than some other types because it's all about really what's going on than the looks of it. They tend to have a theme song. Remember that each one of these types has a theme song. And the expressive theme song is, they'll come into work and they'll sing, celebrate good times, come on. Because they want everybody to celebrate in their party. They want everybody to have fun. And they are the most social of all personality types. Remember, they like to be seen and heard wherever they go. They wear a lot of colors and patterns and sparkles in their clothes. They drive cars that are seen and heard in their office space. You can sit in a expressive office space and gather little pieces of information about them. You know, you can actually see photos of people that they like and love. They tend to have games and candy and things that will draw people into their area. And when people are in their area, they enjoy being in their area. They are, for example, the first person I would invite to a party. But what we want to do is look at the opposite side of the scale, remember. So if I can see somebody as an expressive personality type, I'm going to think, oh, you're going to be naturally very creative. You're going to be very big picture thinking. You're going to be a natural leader. You're going to be great with people. However, if your opposite personality type is really good with details, that's going to be something that naturally is not a strength of yours. So I would invite you to that party. I would not give you the checkbook to balance. You know, I would, for example, uh, love to put you in a leadership position. I would not want you to be in charge of the final findings report generated by your research team because you're not going to be as thorough and complete by nature as the person who's opposite from you on the personality scale. Now, of course, that's not to say that there aren't expressive personality types who are very detail oriented. Of course, there are. And some of them are great with numbers. However, if we're talking about basic natural strengths and weaknesses, I'm going to generalize and I'm going to make assumptions when I don't know the answer based on your personality type and go with that. So now I'd like to move along to the amiable personality types. The amiable personality types are the ones who come to work dressed in 
clothes that are comfortable and kind of people oriented. For example, they wear a lot of soft clothing that, that feels good to the touch. They'll wear sweatshirts with pictures of people on them. Like they'll wear a sweatshirt that might have a picture of, you know, uh, of, 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 a, of a baby. And they'll say, you know, world's best grandchild. And you'll say, oh, is that your grandson, your granddaughter? And they'll say, no, I just thought it was cute. I saw it at the drugstore and just have to have it. They'll have uh, comfortable shoes on, things like Birkenstock shoes or a pair of tennis shoes that they've worn for a long time because they're comfortable. And they'll drive up to work in cars that are people cars. They drive a lot of things such as minivans. Uh, they'll drive cars that look like people, like that Volks, like the new Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, they'll drive things like, remember the Dodge Neon that the front of it kind of looked like a person going, meep, meep. Uh, they will drive cars. They're very rarely going to be seen in two-seater cars because they would think, well, that's a selfish car. You can't have more than one other person in it. And the theme song that is running in their heads when they come to work tends to be, joy to the world. And you, and you, and you, and you. They want everybody to feel the joy. They want everybody to be friends. You know, they want everybody to like them and they want everybody to like one another. They don't like conflict. If you go into their workspace, you will see that they have lots of things that are very personal. You know, they'll have a calendar, for example, with pictures of people on it. And you'll say, hey, isn't that calendar expired? That's from like 2009. And they'll say, yeah, but I really like the pictures. Look, there's a kitty going, hang in there. You know, they'll have plants that are dead, but there's still sentimental value in those plants. They'll have things that their children made them and they'll put those around. And the reason that they want to, that they want, that they put those things up in their workspace is to share that with other people. They love these people. They love these things. They have emotional attachments to things and they want to share that with you. So that's good to keep in mind because when you look at their mm -hmm. opposite personality type, for example, the drivers, the drivers are those who have almost nothing in their workspace except maybe a picture of their children and their spouse or a family photo. But it's very different the reason that they have that out there from the reason an amiable personality type would have it out there. Remember, amiables have things out because they want to share that with you. They want to share the love and the, and the emotion that they have attached to those things. The drivers have things out there because they want to show you that's mine. You know, those they, drivers are very territorial. They spray all over the place. So they want you to know that's not for me to share the love that I have with my family with you. That's so you know, that's my family. That's my trophy or whatever that you want to call it. They tend to be very trophy achievement oriented and they're putting it out there to let you know. And that's really about it or for themselves because they want to look at that and remind themselves why they're working. Drivers tend to come into work in three different types of cars, Toyotas, Hondas, and Nissans. When they upgrade, they don't upgrade to something like a Cadillac Escalade fancy car. They'll upgrade to things that are understated luxury status symbols. Things such as uh, a Lexus. Things such as a, uh, an Audi. Uh, they love Acuras. But they like cars that are, if they're going to be a, an expensive car, they're more understated. Uh, and they're usually classy, somewhat status symbols. Drivers come into work wearing a lot of gray, black, and navy. They tend to have just a couple of pair of work shoes. Expensive, fancy name shoes. But one black pair of work shoes or boots that they use a lot, and one maybe navy pair of blue or, uh, of, of shoes or boots that they wear a lot. And they tend to have more of a militant style to, their, to the way that they dress. And they tend to come into work walking down the hallway with their chest forward, kind of lean forward a little bit because their theme song is get her done, 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 get her done. And what happens is a driver and an amiable will pass one another in the hallway and if they're not conscious of speaking one another's language, what will happen is the amiable will walk past the driver and say, good morning, driver. And the driver will go right to his or her desk because they have work to do. Drivers will think, I am not here to make friends. I'm here to get a job done. That's what they tend to think. And drivers, you know if you're a driver because they really have a problem with incompetent people. So what happens is the driver will go back to his or her desk and the amiable had said hello, but they didn't return the hello. And the driver's thinking, what's wrong with that? And the amiable is thinking, well, because I don't know why they won't say hello to me, but I, I'm going to keep trying to say hello to the 
driver because I know that underneath that cold icy exterior, there's the war hard, not going to get through to it. And what the amiables need to realize is stop saying hello to the drivers. You're never getting through to them. It's not about you. It's about them. And what the drivers need to realize is start saying hello to the amiables. They take it personally and they're not working as hard as they could for you and your team if you don't give them what they need. You know, we tend to see people and we think, oh, you're not getting the needs that I would want met, met. And so we'll try to meet those for other people. For example, uh, I am a driver analytical type. And so what I'll do is if I work in a place where there's lots of people, you'll frequently find me eating lunch in my car because I like to take some time out, recharge my batteries. I get energy from being alone. The opposite personality types from mine get energy from being with other people. But if I need to recharge my batteries, I'll go into my car and I'll be eating lunch alone and I'll be enjoying myself, maybe reading a book, listening to something on tape. And then the next thing you know, I'll hear this tap, tap, tap on the window. You can. And it'll be some expressive or some amiable saying, oh, you're eating lunch all by yourself. Why don't you come on in and join us in the lunchroom? We're having a potluck today. And I'll think, oh, the reason I'm out here is because I want to eat lunch alone. Sometimes we'll see people eating lunch alone in the lunchroom and we'll say, hey, why don't you come and join us? Now, sometimes that's a great idea because we want to be friendly and maybe they don't have any friends. But if they know a lot of people and have a lot of friends yet are choosing to eat alone, maybe we should let them eat alone. Because remember that many times we come into work, we'll practice what's called the golden rule. And the golden rule is to treat others how? Right. As you'd like to be treated. Don't do that. Instead, go into work and practice the platinum rule. And the platinum rule is to treat others how? as they want to be treated. And so what I want to do is study the personality types and treat you the way you want to be treated. For example, let's get to the analytics. The analytics are the types that they come into work dri driving clunker cars. You know, their cars are going to be 20 years old, easy, but it's paid off because they have a plan. You know, they have a strategy for just about everything and they are the least concerned with appearances. So you look at the opposite end of the scale, remember the expressive types are most concerned with appearances and what people think about them and of them, where the analytical types think the least about what other people think about them and of them. And so they will drive whatever car is paid off and still gets them from point A to point B. And they tend to be the ones who don't look like it, but are the millionaires next door. Like if you look at Warren Buffett, for example, total analytical, lives in a very regular home, drives a very regular car, and is one of the wealthiest men in the United States because he had a plan. And analytical types wear a lot of tan pants. They wear a lot of tan pants with tennis shoes because it's comfortable for them. And if you say to a uh, tan pantser or an analytical, if you say, hey, those are some uh, hot tan pants you got there. Do you have anything other than tan pants? They'll say things like, well, yes, I have uh, well, of many different colored pants. I have tan pants and beige pants and khaki pants and off-white pants and green pants. And you're like, they're all tan pants. And remember that you can spot people by their, uh, or you can spot people's personality style many times simply by the way that they talk. You know, analytical types tend to speak in more of a monotone voice and they tend to speak slowly and articulately and in longer sentences than from how the other types speak. You know, an expressive type will come in and, and they might, uh, if they're a customer, for example, an expressive type will come in and they'll say things like, hey, I got a problem. And they're thinking that they're expressing to you why they're there by that quick sentence, hey, I have a problem. An analytical type tends to come in and so you'll say, hey, what can I do for you today? And the analytical type will say, yes, uh, shall I start by giving you my account number? It's 614 See, uh, back on March 15th, what happened was, and they'll start telling you the story using all of the details. And what we tend to do is speak our language, no matter what personality type it is. By the way, remember that analytical types, speaking of theme songs, they don't have a theme song. They don't have time for that type of foolishness. So when they come into work, remember, they do not have a theme song going through their head. That's for those other personality types not for the analyticals. They are much more serious and they're concerned really with their work, not with the clothes that they're driving, not with the clothes that they're wearing, not with the car that they're driving, not with the songs that they're singing. When you look at an analytical's office space, they tend to have lots of stuff 
information stuff. They'll have lots of files, lots of books, lots of papers. If you go to an uh, analytical's home, they tend to have a garage, for example, filled with magazines from 1973 because sometimes they'll get around to reading those because there's a lot of good information in there. You know, they'll have an attic stuffed with books. They take pride in their book collections because they're all about the information. So remember that when we're dealing with the different personality types, remember how they relate to one another. We're getting into this in future lessons and in this lesson, but I wanted to give you a quick breakdown. Again, call them what you will. You can call them the DISC. You can call them the red, blue, green, yellow. The four basic personality types are those. The expressives that come in in bright clothes, they talk a lot, they smile a lot, they're very social, they're very big picture thinkers, they're very right brainers, and they are really good at starting things. Then we have the amiables. They look more friendly, they're very approachable, they're more of a passive personality type. They're very concerned with people. They're usually wearing comfortable clothes and driving comfortable people-oriented cars. They tend to be really good at recognizing what the different uh, communication challenges people are having in the office. They're very good go-to people to fix things. Uh, they really care about the people they work with and the company they work with. Then you have your drivers. They come into work driving their efficient cars. They speak in an efficient way. They wear efficient clothing. They do things in an efficient way. They're very goal-oriented. They tend to be told, and be a little insensitive sometimes, as opposed to the amiables that tend to be told, don't take it so personally. And then we have the analyticals who come into work and clunk, 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 wearing whatever clothes that they think will help uh, get them through the day in the most effective way. Utilitarian is the name of the game. These shoes are good for my feet. These pants work well with just about any plaid top that I put over it. This car gets me from point A to point B. This job is contributing to my 401k. I know the day that I'm going to retire. I have no debt. I have a plan if I do have debt. And I tend to want to know at every moment of the day, where did I come from? Where am I now? And where am I going? Because that helps me feel comfortable. So that said, call them what you will. Those are the four types. Get familiar with them if you are not familiar with them. Go to your local bookstore is what I recommend doing if you have not yet really delved into this. Go to your local bookstore and find the books on personality working styles until you find the book that speaks to you the most, that you can relate to the most. Because what's going to happen is this. Uh, you're going to have a challenge with somebody and you'll think, I cannot understand where they're coming from or what they want or why they're behaving that way. And one of the strategies that we can use to overcome these personality conflicts is when these challenges arise, Go to your working library and pull out your personality styles book till you find that person who is going to chance with be opposite from the personality style that you are, you would understand. And you're going to find them and you'll say, oh, now that I'm reading about them and really taking the time to understand them more, I get it. I get why they're behaving that way and what they need to get unstuck. You'll get how to speak their language more and you'll understand more in these future lessons when we talk about personality styles. Uh, and how to speak to them, you'll have a greater understanding of the style. So this is a topic all into itself. And unfortunately, at this point, I don't, have, I don't have a book or a test to give you that's my own. So go find one that you think is best for you. Uh, I used the one that's in the For Dummies uh, library. You know, there's that thing that's for dummies, you know, web pages for dummies, everything for dummies. They have a great book on personality styles, and it uses these generic terms, expressive, amiables, drivers, analyticals. And uh, once you find that resource, become very familiar with the four types because there are going to be strategies that we're talking about now in this lesson as well that you can easily use once you're familiar with the four types. And now you have actually a greater understanding. If you remember what we just talked about now, what they drive, how they look, how they act, the basics about them, if you just know that, you already know more than 99% of professional communicators and are way ahead of the game simply because you understand the four personality types. And now that you do, let's start off our personality type strategies by talking about style stepping. Style stepping is a strategy that you can use all the time at work. Remember that when you are speaking to a personality type that is different from your type, try and match their rate of speech with your rate of speech. For example, if I'm speaking to an analytical type, I would want to speak more slowly and in more complete sentences. Try and match their tone with your tone. 
you know, for example, by nature, I tend to have learned now to speak uh, using more inflection. I'll go up and I'll go down and I'll speak in many different ways. And it has to do a lot with my job. But if I'm speaking to an analytical type that is more reserved and likes to speak in a more monotone voice and in long sentences, I will try to match that speech pattern so that they are more comfortable speaking with me. And for example, match their preferred method of communication. For example, an analytical type might send you an email and it's a long email. We tend to get emails from analytical types where we'll open them up and we'll say, didn't you have anything else to do today besides write me this email? <laughs> and we'll think, well, you know, I'm just going to give you a quick call to answer it. Remember that analytical types tend to send you emails for a reason. They don't want to talk to you. So keep that in mind. And if somebody is sending you an email and that appears to be their preferred communication style, send them an email back. And if you're writing an analytical, write longer emails with as much information as you can possibly put in them because that's what they prefer. Another way to style step, for example, is let's say that I'm an amiable type, okay? I'm somebody who tends to say good morning to everybody that asks about their family, that asks about people's work, uh, their, uh, their personal life, because I care. What might happen is I might be working with a driver boss and there's a budget review report due by the end of the day. So a, a driver type might come into my office and do one of these. They'll come in, knock, knock, knock. They'll knock on my desk maybe and say, hey, report. And to them, that's an entire sentence saying, hi, good morning. Are you finished with that report or shall I expect it later on today? And if you are an amiable type and somebody comes into your office and says something like, drunk, 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 your end report, you might have the tendency to do one of these. <clears throat> well, good morning to you too, Mr. Sunshine. But don't do that. Remember, it's not about you the way that they communicate. So instead of trying to get them to communicate the way you prefer, be the savvy communicator and decide, oh, wait a minute, this is my opportunity to style step. And instead of saying, good morning to you too, try something along these lines. Four o'clock. Because in a driver's language, what that means is I'm currently working on it and she'll have it to you by the end of the day, which is four o'clock. So speak in short sentences, bottom line it for the drivers. And that's a way that you can speak their language. Another way that you can style step is when you're giving benefit statements. For example, if I'm trying to convince a driver to do something for me, remember that drivers tend to be motivated by tangible results. That's what drivers like to see. So when they accomplish something at work, they want to receive something for that accomplishment. If you can't offer them a paycheck, which normally we cannot, or a bonus or something like that, they like things such as trophies, awards, plaques, letters of recognition, something that they can physically touch and put in their files and say, see, I'm number one, because drivers like to keep little trophy collections. So if I am encouraging a driver to do something for me or for the organization, and I were to say something such as, and your coworkers would really appreciate that, that is not driver language. That is amiable language. So instead, I would want to think, what motivates a driver? Oh, they're motivated by tangible results, something that they can touch or feel or show to their spouse. So if I were to, op so if I were to be trying to persuade a driver type to do something for me at work, I might, instead of saying something such as, your coworkers would appreciate that, I might say something such as, and of course this would reflect well in your employee review, and you'd be more likely to get those promotions or bonuses that I know you're hoping to get. And of course, I'd be happy to write you a letter of appreciation that you can then use not only in this job, but in any job that follows. Or if I can possibly do this, and I can nominate you for the uh, Employee of the Month Award because they like to win awards like that. Or it could be something simple such as, and I think this would really help you with your advancement here in this company and in your career in general, because they tend to be career driven. If I were talking to an expressive type, I might say something such as, and if you could do this for me, your coworkers would see you as the shining superstar that I already know you to be as opposed to an analytical type that would not want any recognition of any kind, really. I would want to tell an analytical type that this would really help them understand the process and become more proficient in what they do because they tend to do things for the process. They tend to do things because they like learning. 
So when I am delivering benefit statements to the different personality types, that is when style stepping really comes into play. And don't give a benefit statement that you would enjoy when you're trying to persuade somebody or get them to go along with your way of thinking or do something or buy something. Frame your benefit statements depending on their personality type, not yours. That is the way you can style step. Again, style stepping can be simply changing your rate of speech, simply changing the words that you use, adding more words, eliminating more words. When you are consciously communicating and speaking to someone the way they want to be spoken to, as opposed to the way you might want to be spoken to, that is practicing the platinum rule. And that is what we call style stepping. And it's amazing how you sometimes aren't even aware, I'm not aware of the personality types that I'm currently working with or living with. You know, if you have not already determined what the personality types are of the people with whom you share most of your life, whether it's at home or at work, start to look around and pick up the signs if you haven't already done so, because you will see how easy it can be to spot other people's personality style, whether they're the drivers or the analyticals or whatever it may be. You can start spotting that if you have not already done so, and that can help you right away figure out what turns them on, what makes them tick and start speaking to them in their language, framing benefit statements to whatever benefits they consider a benefit. And you can start style stepping in many different areas with many different people. What I'd like you to do right now is determine a couple people in your life that you haven't already assessed. You don't already know what their personality style is. And I'd like you in the next three days, without asking them any questions, look at what turns them on. Look at how they live. Look at how they keep their space. Look at what signals they put out. Look at what they're showing the world and determine their personality style and then start speaking to them in a way that might be a little foreign to you, but matches that personality style. And you will be on your way to becoming a master style stepper. And now we have come to our communication principle of the week. Our communication principle of the week is I am in charge of every relationship in my life. What that really means is this. We tend to struggle with relationships. We all do. That's part of our becoming. And when we struggle with a relationship, many times what we have the tendency to do is to say, well, I'm struggling with this relationship with this person because they X, Y, Z. And to fix it, they would need to blah, blah, blah. When the truth of the matter is, remember, we talked about two communication principles that are key. Two communication principles that are key to fixing any relationship really are, number one, to know there is only one relationship. Number two, to know that it is only what I am not giving that could possibly be missing from any relationship. And key number three is to remember, I am in charge of every relationship in my life. So if something has gone awry in one of my relationships, I am the only one who can fix it because that is my relationship. Now, of course, I am not in charge of other people's behavior. I can't control it if my spouse leaves me. I can't control that. You know, I sometimes can't control it if you are abusive to me, if you say unenlightened things to me. I cannot control your behavior. And that's not the point. The point is, it's not about the experiences that I have in my relationship. It's not about what you say to me, how you treat me, what you do, where you go. You know, it's not about if you leave me when really what's happening is you're just going another way. What it's about is not those experiences. It's about how I choose to experience those experiences. What that means is it's about what I choose to take away from these experiences. I choose whether or not I'm going to learn and grow and be a happier person because of these experiences. If I have a relationship in which I am miserable, well, I can't expect anybody else to fix that because I am in charge of every relationship in my life. That's my relationship. So again, I might not be in charge of how you behave. I am certainly in charge of this relationship. I am in charge of the direction it takes. I am in charge of whether or not I decide to continue to see you. I am in charge of whether or not I decide to continue to encourage the behavior that I find unacceptable in you. I am in charge of whether or not I decide to learn a lesson from this and be a better person from it or to remain stuck in some type of negative cycle. And I'm in charge of all of that because I'm in charge of every relationship in my life. And if there is something wrong in one of my relationships, 
It is up to me to fix it. And once I can really let that sink into my brain and recognize the truth that I'm in charge of every one of my relationships, all of a sudden our relationships start to transform because once we realize the truth that we are in charge of them, we can, and that we are in the driver's seat, we can then decide what's working for us, what's not, what's making us a better person, what's not, focus on what's making us a better person, cultivate more of that. And many more of our relationships will start to be relationships that we benefit from, that we are learning from, that we are growing from, that we receive and give love in. And once we recognize that we are in charge of all of our relationships, watch, it won't be long before you start to realize, oh my goodness, I'm happy with almost every one of my relationships. I'm benefiting from all of them. I don't have toxic ones. You know, they'll pop up every now and then, but that's so that we can learn how to manage and work through new and different and more challenging issues. But in general, what we notice is that we know people who all of their relationships bring them down. And then we know people who all of their relationships bring them up. The people who tend to be brought up by their relationships are those who recognize that they are in charge of their relationships. They might not have articulated that. They might not have known that. But what's going to happen is once you realize that you are in charge of your relationships, it's kind of a burden because then you realize, oh, rats, I'm causing myself the misery that I'm experiencing. But that's step one. Then you realize how to work through that and transform different relationships and let the ones that aren't serving you go in a different direction. Let the people who aren't serving you go in a different direction. And you cultivate just the ones that serve you and help you grow and become a better version of you. And all of the relationships that we have eventually make us a better version of ourselves. That is really the bottom line. And the, the, the assignment in all of our relationships, really the outcome of the assignment is to make us a better version of, our, of ourselves. And we can do that and become a better version of ourselves more quickly and more easily if we start by recognizing those three principles. Number one, there is only one relationship. Number two, it is only what I'm not giving that could possibly be missing from my relationship. And number three, I am in charge of every relationship in my life. It's sometimes a little bit scary, but then all of a sudden it's liberating because you recognize if there's something that's not working for you or somebody that's not working for you, that's okay. They're not in charge. You are.